A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. And when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him one after another, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. When they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's nice that it's cooling off to be outside, right? Or you guys like the heat? Is it nice that it's cooling off outside? Yeah, right? It is nice. The, the problem with the cooling off is that we get the breeze, right? That's, that's the thing about Los Baños is we get that breeze that keeps us from dying from that sweltering heat, but it does blow things around and it does add complications to pages flying around, to, to um, the sound. Um, one day we were out here and it was so windy, the poor singers could not hear themselves at all. Uh, the wind drowns everything out. But we're out here because we're in the middle of this this pandemic, these crises, all these things that are happening, and we're trying to we're trying to figure out what it looks like to be church in these times. And I don't even know if that's really a good way to say it because it's not that church changes or should change, but we're trying to figure out how it is that we continue to participate faithfully in what God tells us to do. When this started back in March, we were told a couple weeks, stay home, right? Remember that? Just a couple weeks, stay home. And I thought, two weeks? Can you imagine two weeks of shutting things down in, in the world? That's going to be crazy. How will we survive that? But I tried calming our family, saying we're going to be fine two weeks. We'll do, we'll do video streaming for two weeks. And that two weeks, we all know, has turned into some six months now. And we're trying to figure out what it is. But shortly after the two weeks happened, when, when they decided we were going to continue on, we started hearing new language. Things, words that we'd never used before, at least not in ways we'd use them, like social distancing. What is that supposed to mean? I mean, if a year ago I'd have told you social distancing is a thing, you'd have been like, what? What? That's, you can't have social distancing? That, that makes no sense. Or, or even pandemic has become a new word for us today, right? But the one that really, um, that I want to, I guess the one that bothered me the most was essential and non-essential. Because after the two weeks were over, they said, okay, we have to have some things open. We have to do some stuff. We have to have hospitals. We have to have grocery stores because we need to eat. We need to have the police force and the fire department. So those people, somehow or another, the higher ups or whoever it was that makes make sense of all this, decided we're going to name them essential. They're essential. And so the essential ones can go out and do their things. And the rest of you just kind of hold back. But without ever saying the word, what happened was we deemed two groups of people or, or works or whatever it was. There are those who are essential and those who are not essential. And, and then we even kind of came into this place of some jobs are essential and some jobs aren't. So if you're going to work, the thing that you do is essential to the world. But if you're not going to work that they told you not to, it's quite simply because, well, you and your vocation are not essential. And that's that's hard. I mean, there's, there's no, no right way to tell somebody, and I don't believe it's right at all, to tell somebody that you're essential or this thing that you do is essential and other people are not essential. Because let me tell you something right now. You guys are all essential. Everything that you do is essential. It's a part of the community. But as a pastor, the one that really got me, I mean, and it attacked me right at home, is having the churches basically deemed as non-essential. We're going to let you have it because we have to. We're going to let you do your worship. But you're not really essential. So we're not going to let you do it the way you want to do it. And this bothered me. I wrestled with it a lot. I thought, how do I respond to this? Do I... 
Do I say, okay, I'm going to rebel against this and I'm going to show the government that they can't tell us what to do. Um, and and I, I put a lot of prayer and thought and, and, and listened to a lot of wise counselors about how to respond to this. But what I came down to, what bothered me, what I realized is we were deemed non-essential, the church was, not by the government, not by the higher-ups, but if anybody has deemed the church to be non-essential, it has been us. It's been our communities. It's been the people around us. Because let's be honest. If the Christian church has disappeared from our communities today, how many communities would even notice? So I'm not having a place to gather on Sundays what's so essential about the Christian church. And this, this really, this is something I have been wrestling with since this thing started. Now, let me, let me tell you right now, just so you know, the church, the Christian church, is absolutely essential. It is absolutely necessary. So please know that before we go anywhere. But, but I fear that, that even within the church, we lose track or maybe we don't even know why we're essential because let's be honest if i were to ask each of you individually or i would ask christians across america why is the church essential and they would all agree the church is essential most of them would say something along the lines of well because it's how we worship god okay that's true but why is that essential because in realistic realistically that's circular reasoning the, the reality is most christians don't even know why we're essential and, and to be fair, maybe we don't do this great job of showing our communities why we're essential. And so this passage here, this passage that we read, believe it or not, it points to the essentiality of the church. It points to the purpose. It points to why this matters. Let, let me explain a little, a little bit. Um, Jesus is here at the Last Supper. And he tells them, after he goes through all of this, he tells them about the blood and he says, this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. He says, the blood of the covenant. Well, what is this blood of the covenant that's poured out for many? Now, if I were to ask you as Christians, we would all say, well, we know what that is, Pastor. That's the blood of the Lamb that washes us free from sins, right? Now, that's, that's a right answer. It really is. Jesus' blood does does um, wash us from sins. It is our, our means of atonement. But, but I fear that we don't understand the significance of the blood of the covenant the way Jesus is trying to impress it here. And we have to, as Christians, we have to understand the significance of the blood of the covenant because it matters to exactly who we are. It matters to how we do church. It matters to everything that we claim. And it speaks directly to the purpose of the church. Now, every Christian knows, and if you don't know, I'm going to tell you now, that salvation is by faith alone. It's not by works. You don't do anything to earn your salvation. It's a free gift from God. And I think most of us get that. But to be fair, that's also where most Christian theology ends. We know that it's faith in Christ, and that's all we need to know. And that's a good thing to know. But check this out. God had already foreshadowed all of this in the Exodus. When his people were in Egypt, and they cried out in faith for a God to save them, and this God, the one true God, Yahweh, hears their calls and he sends Moses and he saves them. Not by anything that they had done. They had done no work to be saved. They were saved by faith alone. They were to put their faith in God and follow this prophet Moses and cross the Red Sea. And that takes faith because even, even if the seas parted, which is pretty awesome, I, I'm now, I know that if I were to go out here even to, to the fore bay and we were to walk out to the water and the waters were to part, I would think that's pretty cool. Most of us would bust out our cameras and start going live with it, right? But how many of us are going to walk out into that water while it's parted? Because I don't know how long it's going to last. Right? This is an act of faith to go across there. They were saved by faith alone. And, and this we get. This part we understand. And I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. But if it was all about just salvation... Then as soon as they crossed the Red Sea and the waters closed over the Egyptians and they were saved, they were safe from, from this enemy coming after them, then that was it. God did his work and it should have been done. But that's not at all what God did. He took them from there and he took them to Mount Sinai. And they were to follow them because there's so much more to faith than just, or to salvation than just this, this little thing of, I believed in faith and now I'm saved. There's this big thing that was about to happen. 
really this thing that's more important. Because your salvation doesn't end with this moment of, I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. That's the beginning and end of it. Your salvation by faith begins in that moment. And it prepares you for this journey, for this thing that God is going to do. And he takes them to Sinai. And there he has a specific purpose for these people. Let me, let me read this to you. In Exodus 19, it says that on the third new moon after the Israelites had gone out, out of the land of Egypt, so after they're saved a couple months later, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They journeyed from Rephidim into the wilderness of Sinai. They camped in the wilderness, and Israel camped there in front of the mountain. So there they are in front of this mountain after they've, they've been saved. He's got them there to Mount Sinai. And it says, Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the Israelites. So imagine you're down at the bottom. Moses gets called up by God. Moses goes up there and God says, Okay, Moses, listen. Pay attention. This is what I want you to tell the people. He says in verse 4, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle wings and brought you to myself. I did this. I brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the people. So in other words, if you obey me, if you listen to me, then you will be my treasured possession. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. In other words, all the people, everything's mine. I'm not saying that these are my people only. God is saying, you're going to be my special people, but they're all my people. Everything belongs to me. This world belongs to me. The difference is that you are going to be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. He says, these are the words you shall speak to the Israelites. So this part is so important because this part is like the introduction or the prologue or really like this preamble to, to what we know is the Ten Commandments and to a whole bunch of other laws that God's about to give to Moses to write down and to share with the people. They are the requirements that God expects as a part of this covenant relationship. But the main point, so if you were to go through and read the Ten Commandments and read the law and read all of these things, because this is the beginning, this is the prologue, this is the, the preamble, it is telling you this is the main point by which to understand all of this. This is the part you have to get. I remember being in school. We didn't memorize the Constitution, but how many of you had to memorize the preamble? We, the people of the United States, right? This is the, memorize this part. It tells you why this matters. He says the main point that this specific people, the children of Abraham, the Israelites, the Jews, is that they are to be a priestly kingdom. I want you to let that term sink in a second. Priestly kingdom. Because this is something that might be difficult for us to grasp. It means that the kingdom, the nation, whatever you want to call it, the country, the politics, the economics, the everyday life of the citizens is to be characterized by this adjective, priestly. You are going to be a kingdom. You're a nation. You're a country. Whatever you want to call it today, he says. But you're going to be priestly. That is the primary adjective that describes my people, my nation. And this would be very different from the ways that any other kingdom had ever been engaged in or even imagined. No one would ever imagine a kingdom that would be run the way Yahweh wanted to run this kingdom. This is what it looks like. God is not a part of the kingdom. God doesn't have a role. God is the kingdom. He's the center focus. It would be a kingdom where every single thing, whether it be the way you do school, the way you engage in your economics, your finances, the way you raise your family, the way you go about as community, the way you have your tomato festivals, whatever it is that you do, every single thing of it would be dedicated to one purpose, to the good and perfect will of God. You would become holy to God. This is what he commanded them to do. And because he commanded them to do this, and he states the reason I'm having you do this is that they would become a show people for the rest of the world. They were to be this alternative way of life. 
to everything else. Something so different that people would at first look at and go, they're crazy. There's crazy as that old man Noah out there building an ark. They're crazy. Why would you do that? It makes no sense in this world. But when this world would fail, fail around them, they would look at this way that the Israelites lived, the way of this God Yahweh, and they would see it as an alternative way of life. They would be the show people. Their very act of living as God's people would become an alternative way of, way of life that others would witness. And then in verse 7 of, of chapter 19, it says, So Moses came, and he summoned the elders, and he said before them all the words that the Lord had commanded him. And the people all answered as one. Pay attention. The people, that's plural, the community, they all answered as one voice. Not a bunch of individuals as a group, but the group as an individual. And they said, the people all answered as one. Everything the Lord has spoken, we will do. God, God gives the vows, and the people say, I do. Do you? I do. Do you do this? I do. But not simply as individuals as they chose, but always and necessarily as the community. Do you? We do. Do you? We do. Because this covenant is not an individual decision. It is for the entire community. They will be the people of God or they will not be the people of God. They will be an alternative way of life or they will go back to being like the world. They. And then after sharing all these ordinances for the next five chapters of, of how, to, how to handle all kinds of different things, chapter 24 closes it. And it says, Moses came and he told the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain. And he set up 12 pillars corresponding to the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent young men and the people of young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed oxen as offerings of well-being to the Lord. So all the people got together, they brought their offerings, they sacrificed them, and then Moses took half of the blood, put it in the basins, and half the blood he dashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant he read it in the hearing of all the people and they said once again all that the Lord has spoken we will do and we will be obedient Moses then took the blood and dashed it on the people and he said see the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all of these words I, I loved the imagery of Sinai as a marriage ceremony where God is saying, I will be your husband, your provider, your protector. You will be my bride. If you will do this, we do. Do you? We do. And then instead of being sealed with the ring, it's sealed with the blood of the covenant. And all of this I say because we need this to understand that at this moment, this covenant, and all the nuances of community, of being set aside as the show people for God, is this alternative way of life. All of this is what Jesus was referring to when he said, this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. So first off, it's about being God's people. It's about being the royal priesthood. About being this holy nation to God. And all of this is important to us today as Christians. Because the original covenant was one that was just for the Israelites. He brought them and said, I own all the world. But I'm going to make you my show people to start with. You will do this. And I will seal this with this covenant. The, the, the language that you hear from Moses, the language in the Old Testament, the language in Exodus is very exclusive. It excludes anyone who's not a part of this Jewish family, of the descendants of Abraham. But Jesus intentionally changes the language. And he says it's poured out for many. This covenant is no longer for just this group. Christ has come. Christ has said the kingdom is at hand. He has given us the kingdom of God. It is here now. Now we await for Christ to return to establish the kingdom in full. But we live in this weird time where they already not yet. Christ has already come. He's already claimed this as his kingdom. 
This world is already the kingdom of God. But he has not yet returned to sit on his throne before it to make it perfectly his kingdom. But we who are Christians make a claim that we are citizens of that kingdom. And there is no dual citizenship. I am a citizen of that kingdom right now. This isn't a future thing. I'll be a citizen. I am a citizen. And you will not find anywhere in the New Testament where it says you will be a citizen. Everything is present. You are a citizen. And because of that, I await for Christ to return to bring his heavenly kingdom here. Christ prayed, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come. This is what we await. This is where we're at. But Jesus includes all of these. He says the, the, the blood is poured out for the many. This is the new covenant. That God no longer is excluding non-Jews from being in this covenant relationship. But rather he is inviting every person to become a part of the royal priesthood. Every person. There is no person in this world that is excluded from the ability to be a part of God's kingdom. To be a part of this, of this priestly kingdom. This is awesome. <laughs> this is what God calls us to. And he invites everyone to be his people. All of us to gather. To be the gathering. To be the assembly. If only they had a Greek word like the ecclesia. The church. This is who we are. We are to be the church. And just like the Jews, this part of the covenant has a change. Their entire purpose, all they did was to be a show people, to be an alternative way of life in everything that they did, not just in the way they worship. We're alternative in the way we worship and we choose to do these things for Christ and then those things in the world. Everything about them, their government, their politics, their commerce, every single thing was about being a priestly kingdom. This is continues today. So to be the church is not to be the people who gather on Sunday, but to be the community of God who engage in this alternative way of life. This is everything I do is characterized by this adjective, priestly. It is to make me holy to God. The way I engage in politics, in economics, in raising my family, in, in talking, even the way I worship, all of that is about being holy to God. It is for the good and perfect will of God, period. And you do that so that you can become the show people. Because outside of the church is the world. And we've all been there. And the world has all these promises. And it means well. I believe the majority of the world means well. But they will fail. They have failed. They'll always fail. They will always let you down. And when that world crashes. And they think there's no other way about it. This is the end. They can look to the church and say. There are those crazy Christians. Living this alternative way of life. I'm going to try something different. We invite people often as Christians. Try something different. But the reality is, are we different? Because if we're not presenting an alternative way of life, what is the difference? And so many times, even in our world today, we're like, well, but Christianity doesn't make the world better. So we just make God the priority in our life. He's number one. And then we try to marry God into the world. I bring God into my finances. I bring God into my politics. I bring God into my, my, my everyday life, whereas God is supposed to be your everyday life. God is your politics. God is your economics. He is every single thing. We don't marry and, and bring God into the world. And, and it, is, it is our tendency to say, okay, look, I love you, God. I love to worship you. This is all really good. But you know what? These are different times. And so what we need to do is find where you fit best, God. Don't, we're going to find you a place. We love you. Don't you worry. We're going to find you a place where you fit in the world. And we're going to put you... You know what? You look the most like, like that political party. And we're going to shove you into that political party. Or you look the most like that type of economic system. We're going to shove you into that. Or you know what, God? You look the most like... I think you're going to fit really well. Check out with this group of the way they're raising their kids. It's a little bit freestyle, not quite so helicopter -y, but but open... We're going to bring you and shove you into that. You're going to love it. But this is not what we're going to do with God at all. God is everything. And he doesn't compromise or become a part of anything else. He simply is everything. And this is difficult. It's difficult for us to keep. It was impossible for the Israelites to keep. They failed. So not only is this covenant an invitation open to anyone, but thanks be to God, God invests in our very hearts so that we can keep this covenant. 
You see, Israel failed. They didn't keep their vows to God. They rejected the lifestyle that he called them to live. They said to themselves, we love you, God. We need the ways of this world as well. You, God, need to be militaristic. You, God, need to have a king. You, God, need to let us have many wives. You, God, let us need to let us live this way and engage in those practices and marry you with the Asherah poles and the Baals and Molech and all of these other things. You need to let us do that, God. So they didn't live a life that was an alternative to the world. Instead, they lived in the world as the world, and then they proclaimed their faith while in the temple. And sadly, we see a lot of this today. Oh, we're, we, we are an alternative way of life to God in the church. We do things there for God, and, and we'll prove it. If the government says we have to wear masks, then we're going to rebel and not wear masks. That's how I know how Christian-like I am. I rebel against anything that's unconstitutional. And yet all God wants us to do is be an alternative way of life to the world. But thanks be to God, he works on us. And he prophesied this through the prophet Jeremiah, who says that the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke. Though I was their husband, says the Lord, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. To the covenant that Christ declares at this meal, at this communion feast, is so much more than just obeying laws. It's about being transformed by the Holy Spirit. So that obedience to God is no longer this thing that we are burdened with, but rather a response to our love for him because he sanctified us with the Holy Spirit. Because then, and really only then, can we be the display people that God desires us to be. It is only when we're sanctified that we can be these people. That's why it's so important that we don't end our, our journey with God at salvation. We cross the Red Sea. Hey, you know what, God? I see you taking some people in the mountain. That's cool. That's not for me. I just want to be saved. But I'll tell you what. I'll catch you in the promised land. I know a shortcut. It doesn't work that way. We are to be a display people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. We are to display an alternative way of life for this world. One that looks like Jesus, not like the world. Just saying. And consider the example, the display that Jesus is. Because this is the part that we really struggle with. He breaks the bread. He says, this is my body broken for you. There's significance to this. He is God. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the one who spoke everything into existence. He is all powerful. He could have ended this with violence, with military force. He could have snapped his fingers and made everything however he wants it to be. But he chose his desire, his will was to reject the world's perspectives of a Messiah and be one they couldn't even possibly imagine. And he became the cruciform Christ. His body was broken. And there's so much to unpack there. But we need to know this at the very least about the cruciform Christ, that it is about making others the priority. It's about making a sacrifice out of love. Saying, I could have this. I deserve this. I don't need to do that. But because I love others, because I love the creation that the Lord has given us, because I love my neighbor, I will sacrifice for them. It's about feeding the hungry. It's about clothing the naked. It's about visiting the imprisoned, helping the sick. It's about being a community that washes the feet of others, even when we know that there's a traitor in our midst. That is the cruciform Christ. It's about living in love, and with courage, not with fear and hatred. The cruciform Christ looks like nothing like the expectations of this world. It does not look like a donkey. It does not look like an elephant. It looks like the slaughtered lamb. Period. It looks like Jesus. It's such a huge part of why the communion sacrament is so important. Because Jesus is pointing to his blood and his broken body as the alternative that this world needs. So when we engage in the communion, when we do this, we take of the bread, we proclaim participation in the cruciform Christ. When we drink the blood, 
We, we proclaim to pour out one's life for another. That's the example that we set. If we are to be the display people, then we are to display the cruciform Jesus and nothing else. That's it. That's all we have to do. See, we have to consider the task of the church during times like this. Because with, with elections and, and all these crises taking place, we, we have a lot of questions. We, we begin to ask, okay, what's right and what's wrong? How should the church um, respond to, to the infringement of our freedom? How should the church respond to this? Where does it stand on this? How should we stand on that? How should the church vote? How should the church engage in the world? How should we fight poverty? How do we end abortion? How do we protect freedoms? How do we protect our religion? And all of these are questions that are asked regularly of the church. But listen, these questions actually miss the point, the holy vocation of the church. The wrong questions. Because the entire point of the church is simply to be God's show people. To be the royal priesthood. To be an alternative way of life to the world around you. I want to read you something. This is from Stanley Hauerwas. He says, um, this is a lengthy quote, so bear with me. But he says, I am in fact challenging the very idea that Christian social ethics is primarily an attempt to make the world more peaceable or just. Put starkly, the first social ethic task of the church is to be the church, the servant community. And such a claim may well sound self-serving until we remember that what makes the church the church is its faithful manifestation of the peaceable kingdom in the world. And as such, the church does not have a social ethic. The church is a social ethic. Because the church is where the stories of Israel and Jesus are told and acted and heard. It is our conviction that as a Christian people, there is literally nothing more important that we can do. The church is not, does not let the world set its agenda about what constitutes a social ethic, but a church of peace and justice must set its own agenda. By being the kind of community we see the church that helps the world understand what it means to be the world. For the world has no way of knowing that it's the world without the church pointing to the reality of God's kingdom. In other words, if we don't stand in stark contrast to the world, how can they know they're the world? The scandal of the disunity of the church is even more painful when we realize this social task. For we who've been called to be the foretaste of the peaceable kingdom cannot, it seems, maintain unity among ourselves. And as a result, we abandon the world to its own devices. In other words, since we, we, we ignore them, we're too busy fighting amongst ourselves about what it looks like to look like a Christian. We don't even care about the world. You be the world, we'll be us, and that's that. And so therefore, the first social task of the church, the people capable of remembering and telling the story of God that we find in Jesus, is to be the church. And thus help the world understand itself as the world. For the church to be the church, therefore, is not anti-world, but rather an attempt to show the world what is meant to be God's good creation. Amen. And I love that. That's, man, Harawas has an amazing way with words. But he's right. Well, what is it that we do? Listen, we just live this other way. And the world will see that and they'll say they're different than us. Instead of saying, how can we look like the world and make the world feel more comfortable at church? Listen, I hope you're welcome here. I hope you feel that way. But I don't want you to feel comfortable. Because if you don't leave here feeling a little bit uncomfortable, feeling what someone once told me, like someone gave you a wedgie, and you can't do anything else until you deal with that thing, we're not doing church right. I want us to grow. I want us to be a little bit uncomfortable. I want us to say, do I still look like the world or do I look like Jesus? Am I a testimony of what Christ looks like? And not Christ mixed with the world so it makes it all pretty and adds color to it. But it is in the acts that we do. I took a road trip Friday with a couple of our, um, I'm going to call them our saintly sisters. <laughs> and on the road trip, one of our saintly sisters had said something that was just so amazing. She, she asked a question and said, what if, what if every Christian church in Los Banos just engaged in helping the poor and the homeless 
in those bondage. So I know that some of them are doing that, but what if all of them, what if all the churches, we have a bunch of Christian churches, what if all the churches started helping the people who were poor and homeless? Can you imagine, she, she said, if, if no one needed the government for assistance because the church was assisting? We don't need the government to handle welfare. We don't need the government to build shelters. We don't need the government to do this because the church was just doing the church. Just engaging in these things. This, this was a huge insight. And it's so simple but so profound. You want to know how we fight poverty in this world, friends? We give to the needs of the poor because they need it. That's what the church does. We sacrifice for others. How do we end abortion? By valuing and investing in all lives. How are you going to expect somebody to value a life they can't see if we don't first value the lives right in front of us? How do we protect our freedoms? By giving everything to Jesus. I love this nation. I love being born in America. I do. I, I, I love and I love all those who defend our rights. I recognize the privilege and I'm blessed and honored to be in this country. But the reality is this country may not be here. It may be taken by another force someday. But here's what I do know with all certainty. If I take everything that I am, everything that I love, my family, my babies, everything that I value, and I put them in the hands of Jesus, ain't no one going to snatch them away. Then I'm free. How do we protect our religion? By worshiping God in our everyday lives. By being the royal priesthood. By being a priestly kingdom. Listen, if the church would just be the church, just live as an alternative way, a way that is exemplified by this cruciform Christ. And I don't believe for one second that this world would ever be able to declare the church anything but essential. This, this, my friends, is the implication of communion. This is the implications of church. This is what Christ was talking about. It's not about which is more like Christ, but simply how am I and our church community going to be Christ? How are we going to live the crucified Christ in everything that we do? Recognizing that we don't look to see which parts of the world look the most like Christ and join them, but realize that they are not Christ and be that alternative. We live in fear. And so we do that. We, we hear people say, oh, well, you, the, the conservative party looks more like Christ. You need to be with them. Or the liberal party looks more like Christ. You need to be with them. That's not at all what we're to be. We're to be like Christ and let them look at us and say, we don't look like Christ. We should look like them. And be an alternative. And when we take of the blood, when we take of the bread, friends, this is what we proclaim. And I love it because this act, when we gather together, as I said this before, is like physical therapy. It helps us to reposture ourselves properly, to gather as a community and remind ourselves that this is what we're supposed to do every day in the way we talk, in the way we act, in the way we raise our children, in the way we vote, in, in the way we engage in, in, our, in our economics, in everything. As a way that represents the broken body of Christ and the blood that is poured out for the redemption of sin. And then we gather and we partake of this together. A communion. A community engaging in this act. Saying that together we eat of the body. And so we practice of this thing. To remind us that we make this proclamation, this vow to God. That we will live the way you live. And we will drink of the blood together, saying that we will hold each other accountable to remind ourselves that God's blood is for the remission of all sin. And that because of the work of the Holy Spirit, because God desires to sanctify us, we can live in faithfulness to God. And we have no excuse not to. So I want you to take, to take your cups, and I know they're a little weird to open the little top part and get your bread out and get it ready. And I'll give you a second... And we're going to take of the communion. And um, 
as we do it, I want us to, to start to consider how it is that we reposture ourselves. How are we reposturing ourselves in ways that are different from the world? Melissa, the Lord has laid on Melissa's heart and she's brought up altars up here. Uh, makeshift altars. And let me tell you, anything you make holy to the Lord is holy to the Lord. And so she has these here and we're going to start having them out here again every Sunday. To remind us that sometimes we need to physically posture ourselves in ways that make huge differences to us. That to come forward and to be at the altar, to pray to Christ, to, to rely on that is an act of humility that says, I trust in Christ. And it's a difficult one. If you've never come down to an altar, it's always, oh, I don't know if I want to go. I don't want to go. People are going to stare. But there's a reason that it's awkward because we have to practice it. You see, if being faithful to Christ was natural, you wouldn't need him in the first place. So we have to engage in these practices. And so we'll take communion, and if you like, the altars are open, but we're going to have them here. And I'm just, I'm really bringing this more for a reminder that, that we have these altars open during all times of church, anytime you want to come down. And we'll pray, and I know we live in a COVID world, so when we come, each chair will be changed out before another person comes out. But I want us to just really reflect upon the body of Christ. From the night that he was betrayed, when he knew he would die. The Lord of Lords, the God who created all things, took the bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat the body of Christ. And then he took the cup and he blessed it and he said, this is my blood poured out for the remission of sins, the blood of the new covenant. Drink in remembrance of me. Father, I pray that you would bless this time and this experience. That your Holy Spirit would sanctify each one of us. That you would give us just these, these holy imaginations to, to, to reimagine what it is to be the people of God, to be a priestly kingdom, to live as an alternative to the world. Not, not to, to hybrid, not to bring together, but to be an alternative. Not to reject them, Father, but to do so for them as a response to our love for you. To live, Father, in a place where we would put aside sin, where we would put aside all of our fears and, and hatred, and instead become a people who would just seek you in all things. To be a place where the hurting can look and say, I've tried everything else, but that one's different. Or the ones who maybe have cried out to you and have been cynical and not sure or skeptical, Father, that they would say, I don't even know if you're real, but I'm going to try it because it's different. For the homeless, the hungry, for the scared single mother, for those who are sick. For every single person in this world, Father, who's battling so many different crises and demons in this world, Lord, I pray that they would look to you and they would see through your church an alternative. That they would see a hope that there is another way, a better way. That you would sanctify us, that you would fill us, and that you would be glorified by all that we do. For we, we are your church, Father. And may we always seek to be that community, the priest of the kingdom. We pray this to our King Jesus. Amen. Friends, go in the peace of the Lord.